the necessity on the one hand of defining an architectural question, not a sociological question or an economic question or an environmental policy question, but defining an architectural question and seeing how architecture could, could contribute to that, but also turning that around and saying, if there's a, I don't know, a, a dilemma in environmental policy, how can that actually advance architecture, right? So on the one hand, insisting on the specificity of an architectural discussion, but then on the other hand, uh, that the, the, this notion that technical proficiency is not enough, that, that you also actually have to have uh, a, kind of, a kind of cultural, you have to be if you're making a contribution to the, 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 the cultural discussion around architecture. And some optimism that architecture can make a contribution, yeah. so that if you recognize that there's yeah. an environmental crisis today, sure. which I would say, we definitely agree on right. that, right. that, that so, some idea that architecture can, in a very deliberate way, have an effect right. that's positive, that we can't become environmental experts. We right. have to figure out how architecture can, can yeah. enter into that Exactly. Yeah. Prices. Yeah. So. Yeah. There's a website that, that I. So it's it's interesting because it, I've been looking for a specific project. I keep getting sent to this one website. It's called Inhabit, and they have this logo that says "Design will save the planet." I'm sorry, design will not save the planet. So, uh, but um, it, it, there are some very very specific and and actually this again I think is one of the positive contributions of, of landscape urbanism that the the building by building strategy. And the sort of you know making buildings ever more efficient and they consume less less energy um, is not in the long run actually going to have a, a major effect. In in part because 90% of the building stock already exists. So you know if if you make a 50% improvement on the 10% building stock that's left, your contribution is still at only at the level of five five percent. So. Uh, I think the, the one area where architecture and urbanism actually can contribute is in, in, in rethinking the, the way we make, make cities and, again, the role of nature within the, within, the, uh, within the city. I mean, I've had students recently say to me, because we've changed the school over the last two and a half years to make it a little bit more of an environment to make, put those questions in the forefront and some students have come up to me and said, but you know, what, what is this that you're talking about as an architectural project? You know, why, what, what am I supposed to be doing? And, and, and I think that, that uh, recognizing that, that you can't treat the first, the first year students as saying, oh, you first have to learn the, t the tools and then you can enter into the mm -hmm. discourse. So I say to them, come to the lectures. You may not understand what's being said by these people who come to the school, but you'll learn through immersion. It's like my learning Spanish here. And, and then I think the other thing is um, uh, having a course, which uh, Stan and I both taught a course at Princeton, which was an introduction to architectural ideas before you even have history. You, you say these are some of the debates and ideas that are important in our field, and you put that at the very beginning of the curriculum. So. Yeah, I, I mean, it's every student is different, and um, but to generalize a little bit, uh, the, the problem that, that we faced at Princeton a little bit was was a bit the opposite, um, uh, and and. Um, I think this happens in a lot of North American schools. Um, it's that students get seduced by the the all of the available information in all of these disciplines that touch architecture. And you know, sure, we we understand that 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 there are f phenomena in politics that are spatial, but that doesn't necessarily make it an architectural problem. And so I, I think if, if, if anything, um, the, the, the problem has been to uh, uh, avoid students getting just uh, completely caught up in that, in that cascade of, of, of information and lose sight of actually what the, implication, what the architectural implications of that material are. And I think that's another place where we agree is on sort of that Academia has to have a little more respect for practice, yeah. and that's again it may be an issue more in North American schools. But uh, that that you we can't you can't think of practice as being the place where you're just 
doing stair details and not using your brain. Right. right. No, I mean, the reality is, in, in practice, you write a lot. In practice, you need to communicate. In practice, you need to you need to be creative and produce produce ideas. I just, I mean, I'm also just building on what Sarah said. You, you know, um, architecture in the kind of grand scheme of things is a relative newcomer to the university. And so it's also, I think, about having a certain respect for architecture as an intellectual discipline within the, within the university. And uh, too often, I, I think that uh, architects and architectural historians, there's a certain insecurity that says, in order to gain academic legitimacy, I have to be more like the hard sciences or more like the humanities. And they, they, they actually, again, lose sight of what it is that, that architecture can contribute to the kind of larger intellectual uh, discussions at the university. Well, Leon Creer and Daniel Liebeskin, for different reasons, said um, they, they weren't going to build. They would only draw. Uh, Creer famously said, I do not build because I'm an architect. And, of course, you know, Liebeskin was doing the micro-megas and the, the, the architecture machines and a practice that completely existed within the realm of drawing and as a consequence could could only find its public expression in things like galleries and museums and, 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 and publications. And of course Liebeskin has gone an absolutely 180 degree turn and, and also again I would say, I mean, Liebeskin, even more than Diller Scofidio for me, is he sells the project as a cultural project. And uh, as also, in a way, as artistic expression, yeah. artistic self-expression. And um, that's something I, so th that's one of the reasons I actually didn't include um, Liebeskin in that, that group, because, I mean, I, I would say partially because I, I have more respect both for, for Stephen Hall, Tom Main, and, and, and Diller Scofidio of Renfro that, that I think I think they are genuinely struggling through the dilemmas of what it means to have a kind of um, both I mean by the way also all three of these people run super per efficient professional offices uh, I mean Morphosis is actually rather remarkable on that I mean you know they I mean, they get things done on time, on budget, you know, famously the, sorry, I'm rambling on here, but the, is it the Caltrans building? You, you know, I mean, I mean, talk, they, they basically, this is, this is for a public building and all of the constraints that come with that. They said, look, we're, we're not going to put air conditioning in this building. We're going to take the money, the, the roughly 30% of the budget, by the way, that would have gone to air conditioning. And we're going to use that on a super innovative, um, uh, environmentally responsive facade system that will cool the building. Which, and by the way, is you know a chance for Tom Main to indulge his his obsession with multiple layers and joints and details and transparencies and and meshes and and, and so on. So so you know he very very cleverly at, at that moment made a kind of strategic reorientation within all of the hard constraints of practice, budgets and regulations and agencies and, and so on, in service, in a way, of his own personal expression, you know. So, yeah. so, so, you know, I think, I think these are, in fact, I mean, I mean look, you know, I mean, there are many other interesting practices out there. I mean, you know, well, I may obviously... But those are just American arguments. Those, well, uh, but I also, I mean, again, Chosen for that reason, I think again, just you know, because this is the context I know the best. So, um, and you know, it's again, it's not. I mean, I there are things about all three of those practices I'm critical of, but I think we really have to respect the way in which they um, have struggled with the kind of real world issues of practice without completely losing sight of that earlier experimental work. Do you agree? I, I think um, I think it's a really important question, and I think it, it goes to this issue of both judgment and conversation in the sense that I think that really understanding what practices you respect and why beyond the superficial, oh, I thought that was a really cool building, right. is is something that we don't take the time to do. And I think that's where the, the issue of speed that came up in Stan's talk I thought was really valuable for the example of the... the um, Taiwanese project that I thought was very smart 
of introducing a slow, a quick project in sure. a slow sequence, but I think also recognizing that we need to take the time to actually really think through where we think projects exist. I think we're very good at being an ungenerous discipline and sort of whacking at everyone around us, and I think it's extremely important to determine uh, what you think is good and why, and it may be a building, it may be an entire approach, it may be a writer, and I think that's where the, the issue of the sort of you construct your dinner party, mm -hmm. you, you decide who you want to be part of. The groups, I think, are small, and maybe good dinner parties are no more than 16 people, but I would wish that the discipline could be more generous and those could be much bigger banquets. But right now, I think we're still, you know, I would say my list is, is shockingly small. And that, yeah. that's something that actually I'm aware of and, and think is a problem in our field and in, in the pedagogy. Yeah, and by the way, I mean, those are not by, by any means the architects that I, I don't know, sort of admire most in terms of their, their, their formal language and their, their, their larger approach to, to architecture. It was, really, it was really more to illustrate a very particular point about this this contrast between what they were doing 20 years ago and what they're what they're doing uh, today, and that potential for change and you know the incorporation of of, of ideas that that had their origin. I mean, th this is for me the larger point here, is that that some of the intellectual agility of the academic world and the speculative quality of that thinking has now found its way into what, what's now absolutely main, mainstream. Yeah, I would say right way. now we lack good architectural criticism. I think we lack that conversation being something that is more shared. And I think that's where, I mean, I, I do have great admiration for Mikel and in, in, in the whole project of Arkina because I think, I think his turning it from a, a magazine to a broader cultural project was partly a question of survival, but actually I think it's had more of an effect on architecture culture uh, mainly in Spanish-speaking environments. Mm -hmm. I would hope that that could be emulated by other, you know, or, or reach the states more. But I think that that's, uh, so I think Arquina, I think Domus is, is also doing that with Joseph Grima. And I, I think that that recognition that criticism can no longer be just about the column in the newspaper, um, right. even though I think that should still have more strength than it does. No, I agree with Sarah that, that uh, and, and, I, and I think, you know, there's, a, again, a younger generation of, of people who um, are much more uh, fluent in, you know, all of the media that are, that are uh, uh, available uh, today. And um, I, I, so I'm, I'm kind of guardedly optimistic, but I, I, I think we, we have to admit that we're starting from a pretty low point. So but in, in a way, almost that, anything would be an improvement. I, and I think at that point, I mean, I think actually social media is not the route to criticism because I think mm -hmm. it tends to be, yeah. I think again, yeah. it tends to be too fast and I think criticism right. requires slowing right. down. So there are some blogs that are introducing a means of feedback and, and contemplation, but for the most part, um, uh, the, the web has been just a, an introduction of greater superficiality. Sure. Sure. Yeah, and, and but again, I think that the, the, the ambition that we would all agree with is that um, there's a conversation that could be both have traction within the discipline, but also be legible to the public. Yeah, absolutely.